Now, I thought I would get ahead of the game. I pulled two batteries out from under here. I just didn't realize I was pulling dead ones out. I said, I, I am going to be ahead of this thing. That didn't work out. What is it Dr. Phil says, how that work out for you? First John chapter 4, we're going to be looking at one verse just as a springboard to go into our message today on love beyond words. We all want a love that is beyond words, simply saying, I love you. So this one verse of scripture, would you stand with me in honor of God's word, word like no other. Very simple verse. A lot around it, though. A lot around it, if you read the verses around it. A whole lot there. John said, we love him, capital H, God, or Christ, because he first loved us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It is the message that we receive. And Lord, we pray that would be, that would be brought out th this morning, Father, in a way that honors you and in a way that you can use it, Father, in our hearts. We pray that you would help us, Father, to examine our hearts. Is our love still there for you as it should be? Your love is certainly still there for us as it always has been and always will be. So help us, we pray, Father, as we look at this subject of love beyond words. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. I told you uh, some time back that uh, about a, a young guy who was on the phone with his girlfriend, and he says, I love you so much, I would fight the biggest guy for you. He said, I love you so much, I would climb the highest hill, or excuse me, mountain, just to be close to you. He said, I love you so much, I would swim the widest, the biggest ocean, just to be in your presence. She said, oh, you're so sweet. Are you coming over tonight? He said, no, it's supposed to rain. <laughs> love beyond words. Anybody can say, I love you, but it's another thing to show that we love someone, right? It's a whole different story. We all look for love that is beyond words. We all do. Whether we're children, whether we're parents, whether we're spouses, whatever, and whoever we are, we look for that. We're going to jump right into this message and talk about the love that is far beyond words. It's the love that God has for each one of us. The greatest love is God's love for us. In 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. What does true love look like? Don't ask that in the world today because I stand here today and say, the world around us has no idea what true love is. It, that word has been so abused, so twisted, so watered down and everything else until they, I don't believe the world has any idea of what true love is. What does sacrificial, eternal love look like? It is like God's love. In that same chapter of 1 John 4 and verse 8, it says that God is love. You see, there's things that God does, but he does them because of who he is. God loves us because he is love. And then in verse 7, it says love is of God, true love. The love that we have for other people, that true love comes from God. Love is from God, and it allows us to love people in a very true and sincere way. God is, God's love is the greatest love that we will ever experience. Let me give you a few reasons why he loved us first. This means more than he loved us in time before we loved him. It's much more than that. Uh, listen to Romans 5 verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God made his decision for our salvation when we were still outside of his mercy and grace. When I was still a sinner, 
Jesus had already died for me. When you were still a sinner, Jesus had already died for you. He had already made his decision on your eternity. We simply have to make our decision. God never waits on a sinner to clean up their life. Please hear that today. God never waits on a sinner to clean up their life before he offers to them salvation. I think that that is a huge lie of the devil that many people out in the world believe and will not come into a place like this because they say, I'm not good enough. I'll never be as good as those church folk and so forth. But we understand that Jesus died for us because we were sinners. And knowing that we could never clean up our life enough, we come to him just as we are. Amen? Now, he loves us so much that once we come to him, he doesn't leave us like that. But he begins to do a great work of grace. And on this journey from here to heaven, we continue to walk a little closer and a little closer to him, a little more and a little more like him in our attitude, our actions, and all that we have. Notice the word demonstrates in the verse that I just read out of Romans. Now, uh, okay, the guy's got it up now. Good, it's working. Thank you. Appreciate that. The word demonstrate in this verb, verse is a verb showing that God did for us even while we were sinners, God did this. He sent his son to die for us. Now, God's word tells us that he loves us, but God showed us or proved his love for us by having his only begotten son to die on the cross. We've heard that story so much, the danger is, okay, preacher, what else? Jesus... The Son of God died for me. He died for you. He let them nail him to a cross and suspend him between heaven and earth. On that cross, his blood was shed. On that cross, he gave his life as the sacrifice. I have no reason before God the Father to come and say, I deserve to go to heaven. But thank God, I have every reason to say Jesus is my sacrifice. He died for me on the cross. And that, Jesus is the door to heaven. Amen? Jesus is the key. He is the only way. Jesus said it himself. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. God's love. We all know John 3, 16. God gave his only begotten son to die for us so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever, write your name right there. If Keith believes in me, he shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Personalize the verse. Look at it the way God intended it, that it is for you and it is for me. That's God's love. But what about our love for him? That's the next point here. The greatest love that we can give to God. In Matthew 22, verses 37 through 38, Jesus said to him, there was a, I believe it was a lawyer who came to Jesus and he said, because he knew the law of the Old Testament. He said, what is the greatest law? What is the greatest commandment? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. I've never met a couple, husband and wife, I've never met one who expected their spouse to give them anything less than everything within them. Matter of fact, if that's true in the person that you're with, you got problems. They expect them to give everything that they have within them, all their energies, all of their love, everything that they have. We can love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. And that's a whole message by itself. But listen to this. We might wonder and ask, what can we give God to show our love for him? Let me give you a few scriptures just to bring this around in a very simple way. 
coming off of that verse of scripture. In John 14, verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. There's no Greek needed there, amen? We don't have to go through and dissect that. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, the number one commandment Jesus just told this lawyer was love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is loving God with everything within us. Then Jesus in the next verse said the second greatest command is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then in the next verse, verse 40, he said on these two commandments, loving the Lord, your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, your strength, everything you have, loving your neighbor as yourself, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The law was the first five books. The prophets are the rest of those, the minor prophets, the major prophets, all of those. He's talking about this collection that we call the Old Testament. He said, if you'll do these two, all the rest of it hang on these two commands. So here's a simple way to look at it. If, we love, if our love is right with God and man, we will be right where we need to be. You see, we, we worry about, am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? It's our love that we have to get right first. And I hope and pray that by the end of this message, you're going to understand that. That if our love is where it should be, everything else will follow where it needs to go. So let me end this and try to wrap it up with this, this last point, the problem with our love. And I don't want to rush through this. The problem with our love. You see, God loved us before we were even knew him. He sent his son to die for us before we would even accept him and accept that sacrifice, knowing that many would not. Millions would not, but he still sent his son. And then we can love God with everything that we have within us, with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, giving these things to him. But there is a problem with our love. In Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, Jesus is speaking to John as he's writing this down on the Isle of Patmos and the, he's telling them, I have a message for seven churches. And the very first church is the church at Ephesus. In our Bibles, that letter to the Ephesians is who he's talking about. And Jesus begins to give a whole lot of commendations, great things that they had done. And then he says, nevertheless, in other words, even though they've done all these good things, and I'll try to read those in just a moment, even though they've done all these good things, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love, which is Christ. Unlike God, our love can change. God had this message for the church here in Revelation 2. They were almost faultless in their actions. Listen to these couple of verses, Revelation 2, verses 2 and 3. Speaking to this church, he says, I know your works, your deeds, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. I'm like, wow, to pastor a church like that? Wow. Nevertheless, he says in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. You see, Jesus looked into their hearts. Only God can do that. Only God sees my heart this morning. Only God sees your heart. God sees the content, the motivations, the makeup of our heart. That should scare us. That should cause us to examine ourselves and lay ourselves bare before God and ourselves somewhere along with God. The psalmist says, search me and know me, O God. Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful, wicked above all things. Who can know it? But then in the very, very next verse it says, God has searched the heart. He knows it. So many times we hear about somebody that we thought was this way and all of a sudden we found out it was this way. But you say, God knew all along. Jesus looked into the hearts and knew that their love for him was not there. Warren Wearsby put it this way. No matter how we examine this congregation, we would have to conclude that it was just about perfect. 
this busy, separated from the world, sacrificing church, really suffered from heart trouble. They had abandoned their first love. Then he says, we can serve, sacrifice, and suffer for Christ, and yet not really love Jesus Christ. We might just love what people think of us. This is my words now. We may love something else besides the Lord. If your love for the Lord is not what it used to be, it's not Jesus' fault. He hasn't changed. There was a song back in the 70s that says, it isn't God who's moved. You see, if our relationship and our love and that vibrancy with Jesus Christ is not what it used to be, God has not moved. He changes not. We're the ones that have moved. What's the remedy? Well, the next verse in Revelation, chapter 2, verse 5, he gives them the remedy. It's very simple. It's three points. He says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Again, three simple points. Remember what your love for the Lord was before. You remember that time when you couldn't get enough of God? You remember that time when you couldn't get enough of church? You remember that time where you couldn't sing His praise enough? You remember that time? For many of us, it was right after we got saved. And we call it being on fire for Christ. And everything was so real. We felt like He was right there with us. Everything we did... We woke up in the morning with Jesus on our mind, with a song in our heart. But that was a long time ago, wasn't it? He says, remember what your love for the Lord was before. If you have a hard time understanding that, let me put it this way. You remember what your love was for your spouse when you were dating them? Let me tell you, I used to be in Teresa for an example. I couldn't get enough of being around her. I didn't care what we did, just so she let me be there with her. It didn't matter. We never had a relationship built on what we did. We had a relationship built on being with each other. It wasn't about what we could go and do. I just wanted to be with her. Man, I was working, I was swinging shifts, seven days at a time swinging shifts, first, second, and third. I'd be on third shift. I'd be down at her house after I'd wake up at my house in Bowling Springs. I'd drive 20 miles. I clocked this 20 miles from my driveway to her driveway. And every day I was down there. And I stayed there just until time I knew I could fly out that driveway and burn up, I know I shouldn't say that, burn up the roads until I'd get down there to the police department, come sliding in just about and go in and make roll call. Why? Because I was in love. I was in love. Now, love matures. Love matures. Love continues to grow. What way? I used to have to say with my lips, I can look at her. And we know what we're saying now. Now, come on now. Some of y'all are old as we are. You know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. Sometimes you don't even have to use the words. She told me this morning, I look good. I said, it's your fault. Well, the way I said it was, my wife did that. That's what I said. Our love for God, it can mature, but is the passion still there in some way? Is that passion and that closeness still there? And then he says, repent. Repent simply means turn, do an about face. I'm going this way. As a Christian, as a child of God, I'm getting farther and farther from him because I'm slipping away, slipping away. I got to turn. I got to get back to where I used to be and then do. One, one writer said, repeat. Remember, repent, and repeat. Do the things you used to do to renew that relationship. Now, I'm not the perfect husband. And there's times where I forget to do what I used to do. I'm just being transparent. 
every once in a while, I try to take flowers to Teresa. I never do it on a special day. No flowers for Valentine's because I don't want her to expect it and do it because it's expected. So I'll go up on a no day for no reason. Man, the last time I got them flowers, I went up on North Church Street to the florist. I got a whole dozen. Can't always do that. But I got a whole dozen. I got them out. They fixed them up in there in the vase for me. I come out. I'm trying to get in the car. I'm trying to hold these things. So I open the door. And I'm getting in. And I'm trying to get in right. And I pull the door and I try to do like that. And it caught them flowers. And the top of every one of them was sitting out in the parking lot on the pavement. <sighs> True story. I opened up the door and there laid all the blooms, all the petals, because the door had caught it. I tried to get it in quick enough, but it didn't work. So I got out. I went back inside. <laughs> Those ladies went, what happened? I said, I happened. And I told them what had happened. I said, I'll pay for some more. They felt so sorry for me. They said, no, you won't. No, you won't. They fixed me up another thing. I try to do the things that I used to do. And sometimes the Lord has to prompt me in those things. Well, what about with God? What about the things we used to do, like being in his word, that communion, listening to his voice speaking to us? What about that time in prayer along with God and just, and just pouring out your heart before God and feeling his presence fill that room with you? Let me bring this home. Let me ask the musicians in prayer to come. The verses in Revelation 2, now this is very important. Saturday nights I go over my message once again and I almost want to say that I got more out of this message last night personally when I sat down went back over and did some more reading than I did this whole week working on it when I was able to work on it. These verses in Revelation 2 were meant to be read to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians, okay? He said, this is the letter you're going to write to them and take it to them. Paul wrote to that same church 30 years before this. That's the letter to Ephesians. The last verse is a benediction in those six chapters of Ephesians. The last verse is a benediction. And listen to what he said. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ. What? Say it with me, in sincerity. If you take that phrase, it can be rendered with unfailing love or another way, with love undying. So here's Paul writing to this church and, and, and reading through all that I read through. Paul spent two to three years with this church on one of his missionary journeys. He's teaching them night and day. He's teaching them. They are growing in the Lord. As a matter of fact, we have the... The event in Acts where he was leaving them, he met some of them, the leaders of the church that he had been with before, and he, and he meets with them, and basically it's a goodbye. I'll probably never see you again this side of eternity, and they're weeping. It was a tremendous ministry in this church. And Paul says, don't let you doubt your love die for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, 30 years later, John on the Isle of Patmos receives this from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he says, you're doing all these things great in your actions, your deeds. Nevertheless, nevertheless, you have left your first love. How is it that these things happen? I read and read last night on what happened to this church. I began reading about what happened, this was, a, this was a place where there was a lot of transportation, people coming through, going out. It was a very prosperous place, Ephesus. And this church was there. 
There's no church there today. There was no church there a thousand years ago. This church was gone within about 150 years. Because you see, he says in verse 5, remember, repent, do, or else. I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. We only have one conclusion. If they repented, it did not last long. Preacher, are you telling us that the love that that church had for God was so important that if they were not still motivated by love, driven by love for the Lord, and, and, and had that presence with him that was so meaningful that God would remove them even though they were doing good? Listen, God is not calling us to be robots. God wants a relationship, a vibrant relationship with his people. You think back to Adam and Eve. They didn't commit murder. They couldn't commit adultery. They didn't. There's a lot of things that they couldn't do. All they did was trespass against God's command for them on one tree in that whole garden. Of all those things, one tree, because they had to have a choice. They were not robots. You have to be able to choose to follow Christ, choose to love him, and they chose not to. If you're here this morning, here's the message. We may look good on the outside, but we may have lost that love for Christ on the inside. We may be doing a whole lot of things for our God, but what about in here? The same way every once in a while, I have to examine my love in sincerity for that lady, Teresa. We have to examine our love for Jesus Christ. But, preacher, I'm doing all these things. You know I'm so busy. Tell him that. Tell God you're so busy you don't have time for the God of this universe, the one that gives you every heartbeat, every breath that you have, the one who sustains you and gives you every blessing. I'm telling you, last night when I went over this, this conclusion and looking at these things and reading it, I went to bed. Fred, I went to bed feeling like I had drawn up closer to God because it was making me examine my heart, my life, my walk with Him and what the really important things are. You go back, there's so much in the Word of God. You go back to 1 Corinthians 13. What do we call it? The love chapter. Paul says, though I could speak with a tongue of angels and have not love, I'm like a tinkling, clangling symbol. He said, though I could perform miracles, though I could give my life to help those other people if I do it without love. What is it? Do we understand that serving God is about a love relationship with a God who would give his only begotten son to die for us? We've got it all wrong when we think it's about a list of do's and don'ts. You see, God just simply gives us that for our good so that we won't go shipwreck in our life, so that we will do the things that are right and good and healthy and all these things. But it's all motivated with a, with a relationship of love. God exhibited his love. He demonstrated it, that he sent his only begotten son to die for us. We exhibit ours back to him from our heart. When we sing those songs, I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice. When we sing those songs, it's easy to sing them and never mean it. It's easy for me to stand right here and sing some of these songs out of habit and routine and never mean it. Love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. I know it's convicting. This is where I've been this week. This is where I've been since last night. I understand it's it's so searching. And I guess you're getting the overflow out of what God has done in my heart especially in these last 15 hours, 12 hours. 
John MacArthur says the Ephesians' passion and fervor for Christ had become cold. Jesus' instructions to them were very serious. The invitation today, as Fred and the others come, is not to look at what we do for the Lord today, but do we really love Him like we used to? Is the passion there? I think for every one of us, we just need to slow down and say, where am I at with you, God? My passion, uh, wanting to be with God through his word, through prayer, however it may be. So do we say we love him, but our heart is far from him? Do we do that? Fred is going to come and lead us, and then I'll come back with a ending prayer.